Barbara Selig Brown. Welcome to Stress-Free Cooking. You know that what I want you to do is come home from work, put on your bunny slippers, and pour a glass of wine. But today, I have a very special guest, Ray Isle, the wine editor from Food & Wine Magazine. Welcome, Ray. Thanks, Thank Barbara. you for coming. Great to be here. Well, Thank you for having me. We're just going to change our format a little bit today, and instead of me pouring the wine, Ray is going to wine, be pouring wine the pouring. wine. Why not? Yes. So. so I've asked Ray to come and be my guest because I went to the Aspen Food and Wine event this past summer in Aspen, Colorado, and I enjoyed his seminar so much that I was just, I had to have him on the show, and my only fear was that you were going to say <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd never say no. So and here you, we are. It was, it was great. I met you right after the seminar. It was yeah. a lot of fun. It so. was, you were just terrific. Yeah. So I'm really excited, and I know that everyone is going to enjoy what you're going to share with us. Yeah, I'm going to try and, we're going to do a little bit of Wine 101, a little how to how to open wine, how to, how to uh, you know, taste wine, how to think about wine while you're tasting it, um, a little bit about screw tops and corks and so on, and then we're going to get into kind of the, the meat of the thing, which oh. is you know, what wines go with what food and why right. they go with different foods and, and what tastes great together and all that. And so. we have a great menu planned. We have some great wines and uh, yeah, this terrific is wines. a I brought, show. What I brought also was I brought a range of wines all around the sort of like under 20 zone, give or take, you know, maybe a couple of 22, a couple of 15. Um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc from Chile, uh, Chardonnay from Argentina, Napa Valley Cabernet, uh, Rosé from Sonoma, Pinot Noir from New Zealand. So we've got a whole range of stuff. It's going to be fun. And yeah. I think the important thing too is that where, when we were talking before the show, we want people to be able to enjoy wine every day when they're cooking dinner so that they enjoy cooking dinner. Yes, it does. <laughs> and so the price point was important. Price point's important. You don't need to spend a vast amount of money to get a good bottle of wine. That's, right. you, know, you can get terrific wines right now. It's kind of a golden age for good, good wines at under 20 bucks. There's a lot out there. Um, these are all interesting wines that I think people will like. And, um, and you know, it's, it's fabulous. I, I recommend them all the time. That's what I do in the magazine a lot, is value recommendations, because that's what people are looking for. Well, you know, Ray, my husband and I have always felt that you actually know more about wine if you can find a great wine between 10 and $20 as opposed to just going out and spending it's, a lot of money. It's absolutely true. I mean, you can walk into a wine store and spend 100 bucks and get a good bottle of wine. It's, it's easy. You know, it's like right. you, know, if you spend 50000 bucks on a car, you get a nice car. You can find a terrific bottle of wine between 10 and 20 That's really great. That's, yeah, that's then, where the knowledge really plays in. And probably trial and error. And trial and error. And I do a lot of this. I do a lot of the trial and error in the magazine, which is great. So, you know, I do the, mag the trial and error for everybody else. <laughs> Super. Well, thanks for doing our job yeah, for us. Anytime. Okay, so let's get started. What I thought we'd talk about first is 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 what's the first thing when it comes to wine is is what it's closed with and how you open it. Okay. So you know for years corks were all there were um, except on the cheapest of the cheap. And what you're finding now is you get a lot of screw caps um, turning up on, on actually quite good wines. Yes, I've heard some, that. Some people don't like screw caps because they feel it pulls the mystery out of the wine. I kind of feel that this is the same way that people felt back when they used to seal wine with olive oil in a jar and they came up with corks and people are like oh the corks take the mystery out of the olive oil you know. Oh, it's, um, okay. You know all technological advances kind of weird people out for a while. But basically the the problem with corks is that a certain small percentage of corks affects the wine and gives it a slightly musty character, and screw caps don't do that. So, you know, not a problem if you got a four buck wine, you go out and buy another one. If you've got a two hundred fifty dollar bottle of wine, kind you of don't want to have to go buy another one. Yeah, kind of a bummer when a seven cent cork destroys it. So, and the third thing that's come up recently are these these crazy glass capsules that are glass stoppers. Now, I like those because you I can reuse those. You can reuse them. They're a little hard to open when they're across the away from you but um but it's a tempered glass so it's hard it won't break and it looks cool it's um, it does look you know cool. and it's got a little little rubber ring around the middle so it seals quite well and there's um, a lot of uses for this and there's a lot of uses for it you can you know, you can collect them and, and make you know special projects out of them or something <laughs> corks the, the the screw cap you know is easy simple to open doesn't mess up the wine and then if you want um one thing about opening wine is you know a lot of people find it difficult it's really it's really very easy um if your fingernails are strong enough to get the blade open on the thing. When you're taking the capsule off of the wine, mm -hmm. what you do, take the blade of the, of the corkscrew, put it below the little rim here, so you've got something to to put, to move against. Oh, okay, so it gives like you that. some leverage. Gives you some leverage. Then you can just kind of peel it right off, like that. Oh, wow. That's nice. Oh, and we do have a plastic cork like that. Excellent. Um, this is the uh, fourth, see, you never even know quite what you're getting. 
this case, it is a plastic cork. So you just screw in like that. They're a little bit harder, aren't they, than the actual they, corks? The plastic corks are a very tight seal. So, um, and they're not good for wines that you're going to store for a long time, but they're great for wines you're going to drink, you know, right the next year or something like that. And that's a nice little plastic cork. Yeah, and actually that looks more like a cork than most plastic, than most it's plastic not cork. bright they color. They started making them more designy. They, they've, <laughs> you know, they come in weird colors or they come in cork colors or they come with, you know, little cork labels on them. In any case, that's, you know, that's wine opening 101. Okay, great. Um, but. And then wine. Well, yeah, what are you saying? But we, we just have to deal with this then. You know, you're going to start finding 30, 40, 50 buck wines with, with screw okay. tops on them. Um, are the Italians grabbing onto this? Italian, pretty much everybody. Okay. It's Winemakers get really testy when their wine is destroyed by a, an expensive cork. You know, it's still I still like the cork. I like the pop. I, like I the, do too. You know, I like the ritual of, the of it. But they've started making, I will say that you're, I mean, this is the classic screw top. They started making them with a flat side. So they look much more streamlined and kind of, you know, just oh. a little bit more appealing. Okay. Um, so, you know, depending on how, how your aesthetic sense goes, you can find what you want. Chilling wine. People ask me about this all the time. The fastest, fastest way to chill a bottle of wine is a bucket with ice and water. And water. And water. Yes. Bucket with ice, fine, but bucket with ice and water, the water conducts the cold through to the wine. Um, that'll take you 15, 20 minutes to chill a white wine down to surface And that, I guess with the water, there's more, the, the surface of the bottle is completely it's touched completely by cold. completely touched by cold, exactly. Right. And if you want to speed it up, you spin the bottle. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, because it moves the wine around in the bottle. Um, that takes 15, 20 minutes. If you put it in the freezer, 45 minutes to an hour, don't forget it because right. it'll freeze and it'll blow the cork out or explode the bottle. And, and then you have it. a nice mess in your yeah. freezer. Yeah, people do that with champagne all the time. It's like, poof. Um, oh, yeah, not a good thing. And then thing. if you want, you know, if you wanted to put it in the fridge, you're really looking about an hour and a half before okay. the wine's going to be cold enough to drink, you know, and taste the way you like At it. At regular refrigerator temperature, which is about 36 degrees. Actually, yeah, that'll be a little above regular refrigerator temperature is Amer Americans typically us. We typically drink red, white wines a little too cold. We typ yes. typically drink them right out of the fridge, 34 degrees. You actually want it about 10 degrees warmer than that, 45 to 50 degrees. Okay. We tend to drink red wines a little too warm. Warm. So what I suggest to people is they take a bottle of red and they put it in the fridge for 15 or 20 minutes before they serve it, drop it down to just a little bit below room temperature and it'll taste you know, you can improve any wine instantly by making it just a little cooler than room temperature. So 15 to 20 minutes on the reds to bring them to the cooler temperature right. and 15 to 20 minutes on the whites to bring that, them to yeah, a slightly pull, warmer pull temperature. The, pull the white, if you've, if you've had it in the fridge overnight or you've had it in the fridge for the past year and a half or whatever, pull it out for 15 or 20 minutes and then serve it. Um, okay. You know, depends on what you like too. If you like your wines freezing ice cold, you know, Sort and that, that masks some of the flavors, but I think yeah. some people just like things very cold. Yeah, and, and if you're going to go sit out by the pool or something in the summer, mm -hmm. you want things really cold. Um, you know, one of the key things I tell people about wine is drink what you like and drink yes. the way you like it. You know, I, I'm, I'm a wine editor. I can tell you to buy all sorts of things. Right. Drink this, drink that, because this is going to go well with that. If you like big, massive red wines with ceviche and it tastes good to you, Go ahead. You know, it's that is that is an unusual <laughs> you know, it's, combination. It's but a weird yeah, combination. I see what you're it's, saying. Um, you know, it, or if you like, you know, light white wines with a steak. It's, you know, it's your house. It's your house. So it's, it's your, your kitchen. Food, Cook and drink what you like. But yeah. if you are in, interested at all in knowing what goes together, yeah, we're here to tell you. Yes, we are. Yes, <laughs> I mean there are some things that work pretty well. Shall we taste a little? I would love to taste. Great. It. Well, why don't you hand me a glass? A white glass. Um, sure. We'll just do now glassware. Just talking about, you know, almost anything will work for wine. Some of the best wine I've had, I've had out of a plastic cup oh, walking, no. you know, around in Paris or something like that. Okay. Um, it, wine's contextual. If you're with someone you like and you're in a fabulous place and you drink a bottle of I wine, agree. that wine is going to taste really good. I agree with you. You know, and if you're busy splitting up with your boyfriend or girlfriend and a truck runs over your cat, whatever you're drinking is going to taste horrible. Oh, that's a good point. Um, but that said, it's nice to have glassware where you can smell the wine as well as taste it. Mm -hmm. So when you have a glass like this, and this is a pretty good tasting glass for white wine, fill it, you know, to here or so. Is I, I always tell people about where the glass starts to curve in again. Exactly. About where the glass starts to curve. If you've got a balloon glass that's more like this, you know, a, a lower layer. Because you want to be able to, as I'm going to show you, um, here we'll start with a little, little red, even though it's a white wine glass. Um, it's a little more visual. Um, you know, and there's, there's no... 
ruthless, hard and fast rule about what glassware you have to have. You know, it's not going to kill you to drink red wine out of a glass that was designed for white. Right. You know, um, but basically, what you do when you taste wine, most of the time when we drink wine, we drink it, we eat, we talk. We don't really think while we're tasting. So if you're actually tasting wine, if you want to taste wine, kind of as, as a pro or whatever. You're going to think while you taste. You're going to think about what you're tasting. And so you look at the color, and then you swirl the wine. Mm -hmm. And if you've never swirled wine before, the easiest way to learn is to put the glass on a flat surface. Yes. And, and make move it in little circles, and the wine will swirl around the inside of the glass. The reason you do that is it coats the inside of the glass with a very thin layer of wine. Wine's volatile because it's got some, some alcohol in it. That brings up all the aromas. I mean, I can even smell this from here now. Oh, it and smells it's, great. And it's, Classic Cabernet, currants, yes, you can, spice. Mm -hmm. um, so you swirl it, you sniff it, you sip it. You slurp it if you feel like it. Um, I have a problem with the slurping, but the slurping, you I, know, I admire people who can do it. If you're the only person <laughs> at the table doing it, you feel weird. If you're in a room full of 20 people all tasting wine, you then feel you don't perfectly feel normal. <laughs> and then you swallow it. And Tastes and you taste the wine, and and you, and you think, think about, about it. it. You think, well, what does that taste like? Like, one, is it? Does it taste like fruit? Does it taste like spices? Does it? Um, is it? Is it really tannic? Is it like you know, tannins are the astringent compounds in wine and red wines that give it structure and make it kind of feel like you've got sweaters on your teeth or feel like your tongue's going to move from your mouth. <laughs> um, and that's a you know that's a that's a cabernet twenty buck cabernet. This is a really very classic. I think very classic Cabernet. Where was this one from? This is from Napa Valley, and unusually, you know, it's known for more expensive wines, but really very, good. very nice. One risk of swirling, I will tell you right now, is if you start swirling wine, you'll start swirling everything. Yes, I and do that. You'll I end do up, do you'll that. end up yes. swirling milk. You'll yep. end up swirling Coke, and people, you know, your friends will they look at you, at you and kind of like, funny. What are you doing? Yeah. And you'll say, I'm swirling, of course. Well, um, that's, I would call that an icebreaker. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Either that or a way to look odd in front of your friends. Well, you know what? We better cook. I was going to say, what, before we go on to the next wine, why don't we cook a little bit? So the menu for today was planned so that we could illustrate the different flavors in wine and why you would want to use those wines with certain foods. Right. So I'm going to start out with just some baby potatoes. These are just little Dutch gold potatoes. And this would be a nice complement to the veal chops that we're going to be cooking and the salad that we're going to be making. Right. So what we want to do is just put these in a nice oven proof dish and sprinkle a little bit of extra virgin olive oil on these. And then I have some rosemary, I think, right over there. Yes. yes. And we're going to take cut, a little bit of right that rosemary the right from the back deck, right? So when you're getting your rosemary off the stem, all you do is hold the stem and just pull away from against the grain, against the way that it grows, OK? And that one has an extra branch. So there we go. So I'm going to let you try one, Ray. Right, OK. You can do that. Do a little rosemary <laughs> pulling. I'm I love the smell of this. And rosemary roasted potatoes to me go with everything. We just need to add a little salt and pepper to this. Okay. And That's we have uh, a pepper mill, or actually, I have this today because I wanted to show people that you could shortcut and do this very quickly by mixing salt and pepper together in a little bowl so that you don't have to take the time to grind the pepper. I'm just going to shake this up a little bit and pop this into the oven. These baby potatoes will probably take about 30 minutes or so at 400 degrees. I have my oven on convection so that the fan circulates the heat nice and evenly and they'll be done in no time. Before we get to the salad, I think we should start, in the interest of time, I think we should start our veal chops. Absolutely. So I'm, pro, I'm pro veal chop. <laughs> okay. Well, I know I did promise you veal chops and I ran all over looking for these because I wanted nice ones. So we have three rib veal chops. These were about an inch and a quarter thick. So they're going to take maybe about 10 minutes or so to cook to rare and all I did to these was I put a little salt and pepper on them a little extra virgin olive oil and some rosemary so we don't really need to do anything to the pan we're just going to put these right in the pan okay and then you do want to hear that it's sizzle such a, it's such a good sound isn't that a great yeah, sound that when sound. you put the veal chops in there or any protein in the pan you want to hear that sizzle that way you get a nice sear Let's turn this one this way, okay? And I can get rid of that. We'll hang on to that. You can just put that in the sink. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we're going to let the veal chops cook just like right. that. But in the meantime, I really want to hear about selecting wine for a salad. So we have a bowl of greens. 
That is a bowl of greens. That is and a bowl of greens. And soon it's going to have some, some dressing on it. The selecting wine for a salad is interesting. You know, people people tend to think of vinaigrettes. You know, it's kind of like classic salad dressing has vinegar in it. It's yeah. going to have tartness and it's going to have you know a sort of a, a, a acidic character. And um, you would think that what you would want would be a nice big soft white wine to go with it. In fact, what happens is because it's tart. It actually, your mouth adjusts to the tartness. So, what you want is a wine that's also tart because it's going to taste slightly sweeter and softer mm -hmm. with the salad. So, essentially, a tart wine is going to taste a little less tart and a little softer and sweeter with a tart salad on uh, dressing. So, what you really want is something like a Sauvignon Blanc rather than a Chardonnay. Sauvignon Blancs have that great citrus zesty, grapefruity character, mm -hmm. a lot of zingy acidity. Chardonnays can be softer and more buttery. Um, and so it's kind of counterintuitive, but if you taste them, and I think you know, as we get the salad going, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pour you a little, um, I'll pour a little Sauvignon Blanc, and I'll pour a little Chardonnay, and you can taste the two of them. Okay. Side by side. Very different wines. Very different wines. Very different body. Very different. But it's interesting when we talk about wine and talk about body and wines. Um, the way a good way to think about it, because um, wines have weight, they kind of yes. have you know heft to mm -hmm. them. Think about it in terms of like milk. I like, love this analogy. Yeah. Light, light wines are like skim milk. Medium bodied wines are like 2%. Yes. And really rich big wines are like, are like whole milk. And you can actually feel the textural difference in your mouth. And when you think about pairing with food, one way to think, one very easy way to think about pairing with food is how, how big and heavy and rich is the food you're pairing with. Yes. And kind of go with a wine that's about equivalent. So if you've got a big, rich, massive bowl of short ribs that have been braised forever in a thick sauce. and One of my you know, favorites. It, yeah, not a bad thing. But you want a big, rich, intense wine to go with them. If you've got something like Dover Sole that's very light with a little bit of lemon and, and practically nothing else, you want a light, delicate wine to go with it. That's, you know, you can, you can kind of even stop thinking about flavor initially and just think about that. Think about, think about, think about weight. weight. Think about what would, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a very easy way to get wine pairings that work out very well for you. So here's a little Sauvignon Blanc. And here is a little Chardonnay. Okay. And what I want you to do, if you can, is swirl them and smell them. They're Together be, or separately? If you can swirl both at the same time, then, you know. Practice. You're, that's good. You're, you're doing good. <laughs> I don't know if you're I, a champion swirler. I don't know if this is good or bad. <laughs> and then smell them, and you and the, you can just, you absolutely can just tell the difference between them. Um, definitely. You know, the, yeah, the Sauvignon is much brighter and more yes. and more citrusy. Mm -hmm. the Chardonnay is going to be. And you do feel like you want this with the salad. You do, and I guarantee you, when you taste the salad with it, the Sauvignon is going to come off actually a little softer than it would normally seem. And the Chardonnay is going to seem a little kind of blob-like. And blob like is something you want to avoid. Yeah, we don't want blob like. In, in <laughs> so, all cases, in all no cases, matter whether yeah. it's food or wine. Yeah, or, or me, or any. You know. <laughs> so maybe I should mix up some vinaigrette so I that we can taste I think a vinaigrette and we compare. should taste and compare. And if you want me to flip those chops at some point, just That would know. be great. Why don't you flip the chops? I'll get a bowl to mix some vinaigrette. Okay, great. Ray, if you could hand me the red wine vinegar. Absolutely. Okay, now go. we're going to make a classic vinaigrette here. So we're going to start with our acid. Acid could be wine, or could be wine, could be vinegar, could be lemon, could be a fruit juice, whatever you like. Okay, and I need my salt and pepper. So a little bit of salt and pepper. Okay, not too much. And you want to think about the other ingredients that are in the salad. So, for instance, if I was putting Parmigiano Reggiano cheese in here, that can be salty. So I'd go a little lighter on the salt and the dressing. Now, while I'm whisking this, I want to add my extra virgin olive oil. And actually, if you want to do that, that'd be great. Sure. Okay. So while you're whisking, you add the extra virgin olive oil. Now, this is more of an Italian vinaigrette because I'm not adding the mustard to this. It would be a French vinaigrette if I added mustard. Good. We could also add some herbs to this once right. we have it emulsified. That looks about right, I think. So keep whisking until it's nice and creamy. Keeping in mind that if you whisk your salad dressing rather than shake it, it's going to stay together longer. So it makes our life a little bit easier. Let's grab a tasting spoon over there. That's the thing to do. It, actually, there's some huh? small ones right there. I know, it's hard when you're in someone else's kitchen. I know, it? it's mysterious. Yeah. Everything's <laughs> in a different place. I don't know what to do. 
And um, you're left-handed, though, aren't I am you? And I yeah. am, too, so. Hmm. Now, I'm going to suggest something. Taste that vinaigrette. Okay. Then taste that wine. And you're going to find that that very tart Sauvignon Blanc suddenly tastes softer, very fruitier, soft, very mellow. Yeah. Now, if you taste the vinaigrette, we're going to share glasses. Um, taste the vinaigrette again. Now, normally you wouldn't be right. drinking vinaigrette straight, but <laughs> for a tasting example. And then you taste the Chardonnay. And the Chardonnay actually tastes almost coiny, almost too much. Um, mm. Almost like it's almost gummy oh. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Which is odd because it's it, it, you would think this being tart, you want something soft right, for contrast. Right. In fact, what you want is something a little tart because it softens it up. Yeah, um, this is excellent with it. One thing to think about when you're pairing food and wine is that food affects the flavor of wine much more than wine affects the flavor of food. Okay. So the food is going to have more of an effect on, on what you're tasting from the wine. The wine really isn't going to affect the flavor of the food quite as much. So what you're looking for is something that makes the wine taste better. And so you're looking for a wine that tastes better with the food you're, you're eating. Oh, great. That, that makes a lot of sense. Now, the other thing, though, that I was just thinking was, um, I, I know you've said this in your seminars, <laughs> You don't always just think about the protein that you're serving, but you also want to think about the sauce, so you take it one step further. Yep. So I'm cooking veal, but if I'm going to put mushroom sauce on it, we have one wine. If I'm going to put a tomato and corn salsa on it, we have another, another wine. wine. Okay. If you, and that's, you know, especially with lighter proteins like veal or, or pork, you know, the other white meat, um, you know, mm -hmm. when the, if you have a fairly strong flavored sauce, that's really going to be the dominant flavor of the dish. Yes. And that's what you're pairing to. So that's more there. important than whether it's chicken, veal, pork, right. or beef. Which is, and if you take it and look at it another way, if you take something like a simple roast chicken, which is salt and pepper roasted mm -hmm. chicken, I mean, fantastic. But chicken by itself is actually very wine friendly. They'll go with practically Like anything. turkey. Turkey. Turkey, the, the, the world's most flavorless main course bird. Yes, you know. exactly. And turkey you can pair with a red wine, pair with a white wine, pair with a sparkling wine. If you put a, a beautiful kind of orange glaze on that turkey, it starts to change how you might pair it. Yes, wine. exactly. And I think that's the Thanksgiving dilemma, isn't it? Is that we have it's so many flavors going on with the turkey. It, it is. So it's not about the turkey at all. It's no, it's about all the side dishes. You've got two, you know, 27 side dishes in one turkey. And and honestly, for for meals like that, maybe the Thanksgiving or Easter Easter dinner or, or any kind of big meal with a central protein that's fairly straightforward and a whole bunch of side dishes. What you look for then are wines that are easy going, kind of pair across the board with a lot mm -hmm. of things. So not, not wildly acidic, not wildly tannic, but kind of middle ground. And what I usually suggest is something like Pinot Noir, right. which has a lot of flavor but doesn't have a lot of tannins. And aren't those also good wines for people to start out with while they're learning about pairing? They are. I mean, I think Pinot Noir and an honestly dry Riesling, not sweet Riesling, but dry Riesling, are two of the most food friendly wines on the planet. Um, Pinot Noir is a little tricky because finding really good, inexpensive Pinot Noir is tough because it's very hard grape to grow, and there's a lot of demand for it right now. Oh, okay. Um, Malbec from That's Argentina. That's why we see less of it. You see less of it, and, and you see, unfortunately, you see a lot of 10 or 12 black Pinots that don't really taste like Pinot Noir because the rules with wine in the U.S. say that it only has to have 75% of what's on the label to be labeled as Pinot Noir. You know what? I think we are running out of time, so let's get a mushroom sauce going. Absolutely. Because then I know you can really explain to us how to talk about how to pick a wine to go with the sauce. Right. So with a mushroom sauce, what are you looking at? You've got a beautiful peel chop. Can this, I have the mushrooms? And you can have the mushrooms, because it's very hard to make a mushroom <laughs> sauce with no mushrooms. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so with the, with the veal chop, you know, this is this could go with a wide range of reds. It could go with a Merlot, it could go with a Pinot Noir, because the veal is fairly forgiving, you know, light, lighter meat, lot, nice flavor. Extra virgin. Extra virgin, absolutely. Thank you, a little bit. Um, and, but when mushrooms, Good. when you throw in mushrooms, what you start to get is that earthy quality, what they, yes. what they call umami, which is that 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 fifth, that taste, fifth sense, that right? Fifth sense taste, <laughs> right? Um, and there, there you start to think, well, okay, I've got an additional flavor here that makes me start thinking about what would go with this. And Pinot Noir always has a little bit of earthy edge to it that um, that goes particularly well with mushrooms. I always say, if you've got a mushroom dish of any kind, Pinot Noir is the way to go. Oh, okay. And that's and so that's suddenly, great. rather than 
Well, let's have whatever red wine with this. You start to think, oh, that actually might be a nice combination. Pinot Noir and mushrooms. It might be that little notch up that makes it a really right. cool Right, from thing. knowing that you want a red wine to right. knowing which red wine you want. Right. So if you did this with some kind of fruit sauce, if you did this, I mean, you usually wouldn't do veal with like a, or like a blackberry coulis or something. But if you did, you would think Cabernet, darker fruits, a little more robust. Right. Know. Or if you if you charred these, if you seared them, you know, and did and some kind of spicy sort rub, of like a similar to a blackening, sort of blackening or thing. on the grill and the flame got right. away from you. Then you'd start to think, well, what's a wine that has a little bit of a kind of smoky, spicy edge? And that might be Syrah or Cabernet rather than Pinot Noir. So, you know, you, wine pairing, one key thing about wine pairing is wine is really food friendly. So it's very hard to go radically wrong. It's not like you're going to pick the wrong wine, you're going to pour it at a dinner party, and everybody knows it's going to be like, oh my God, I'm never coming over Never there coming again. here again? <laughs> That's terrifying. Most wines work with most foods. It's pretty forgiving. But there are neat combinations that suddenly like make the flavors pop. So there are certain great combinations, and I guess it just depends how specific you want to be. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, but, but I always say, you know, experiment. Play around. Open a couple of bottles and taste them back and forth and see what's you know see what's good. And and don't worry about it too much, you know, because a lot of foods, you know, any of the foods here could go with you know veal can go with a white wine, could go with a big rich Chardonnay. Um, could you let me a spatula, please? So um, a big rich Chardonnay and veal, sure. Why not? Because because yeah. you know something like a big white wine can go with a white wine without any problem whatsoever. Again, that goes back to that question of body, like how heavy is it? And you can get white wines that are actually richer and more robust than some red wines. And rosé is my secret weapon for pairing. I love rosé. Dry rosé can go with practically anything. It's got some of the fruit of red wine. It's got some of the acidity of white wine. And it's, you know, that would be fabulous with this. It's and fabulous. also, I think it's that middle of the road. Like if a meat is a lighter meat, like a veal or a pork, right. and you're not sure which way to go, I think rosé. And rosés have come... Oh. Come back a long way. Now, yep. They're not white Zinfandel, which is sort of sweet and soda body, but the actual dry rosé. Plus, they make you feel like you're sitting in Provence. Yes, you know, which, which is wonderful. Which is nice. Yeah. It's a good thing. <laughs> what wine would you like to put in our mushroom sauce? We have some sliced mushrooms, a little extra virgin olive oil, some salt and pepper. And We're going to add some wine. It's going to thicken this up. I think, you know, um, the nice thing about also when you're making a, a wine sauce, when you're doing a reduction or something like that, Use wine that you would actually drink. Yes. Oh, for you know, sure. Use wine that you wouldn't and mind And not drinking. cooking wine. Not cooking wine. Actual wine. And, you know, in this case, a splash of wine from the bottle will be, you know, the same wine and then serve the same wine So with it's a it. compliment. It'll complement it very well because it's exactly the same wine. Great, great. Um, well, Ray, just one last question because I think we're running out of time. How about people that are afraid to eat dishes that have wine in them. Does the alcohol really cook the, out? The alcohol does. You need to cook it for about five minutes or so. Okay. And if it's boiling like that, the alcohol will cook out. Um, there, there, you know, there could be a little residual alcohol. The longer you cook it, the, the less alcohol there's going to be. But it does vaporize. Alcohol vaporizes at a lower temperature than water, so it's going to come out. And I always tell people, if you're adding wine to a dish, add the wine before any other liquid. I think that that's a good And that rule way you'll though. cook out more of the alcohol. You'll cook more of the alcohol that way. Ray Isle from Food and Wine Magazine, I can't thank you enough for joining me today on Stress Free uh, Cooking. Um, thanks for having me, Barbara. It's been, it's been fantastic. It's Will been you come fun. back again? I would love to come back anytime. Well, thank you. Please join us again for Stress Free Cooking.